Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar, Misconceptions About Fruit. I'm Dr. Rick Dina and you'll be hearing from Dr. Karen Dina in a few minutes. We're both chiropractic physicians who have been on the whole food plant-based path, heavily fruit and vegetable oriented for 35 or more years each, essentially all of our adult lives and are board certified and licensed in the state of California. For those of you who don't know us yet, we have hosted summits for the past nine years. Here is the banner for the first eight years, and here is also the uh, Raw Food Nutrition Handbook that we're the authors of, and here is our banner for the most recent year, 2024. In each of these summits, we interview different plant-based doctors and raw food and plant-based educators to share inspiring, informative, and useful information about implementing plant-based diets. There are a variety of different approaches out there, and it's good to know that there is a little bit of flexibility for individuals within those different approaches. Our approach can be summed up by whole food, all plant, based on fruits and vegetables. We are the course developers and instructors originally for our Science of Raw Food Nutrition series of classes, and more recently for our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition 12-month online curriculum that you can learn more at the end of this webinar if you want to stick around and do so. Please note, however, before we continue, that the information and opinions expressed by us in this webinar are not intended to be used as medical advice and should not be used to diagnose or treat any medical condition or as a substitute for individual health care. This webinar is presented with the understanding that we're not liable for misconception, misuse, or adverse effects resulting from its use. Any type of dietary change, nutritional therapy, or fasting should always be undertaken with the supervision of a qualified healthcare provider. And watching this webinar does not establish a doctor patient relationship. Each of our webinars tend to follow the same pattern. We've got the introduction, which is pretty much covered now, and now we've got a little of Dr. Karen's background and my background, so you know a little bit more about who you're hearing from in this presentation. I'll let Dr. Karen take it away with her background. I found raw food at a time when I was experiencing notable fatigue, for which there was apparently no answer. I was in college at the time and I was sleeping 10, 12, and sometimes even more hours per night and still waking up non-refreshed. I saw three medical professionals, and after multiple lab tests and evaluations, I had a diagnosis, fatigue of unknown origin. They had a whole list of everything that I didn't have, but could not pinpoint the source of my fatigue. I asked every single one of them if my fatigue may have had anything to do with my college diet and lifestyle. They all emphatically said no. Things really started to change, however, when a friend gave me a copy of a book that discussed vegan diets and the connection between diet and health. I also learned about the connections between diet and the environment and the way animals are treated. And with all these compelling arguments, I was open to giving this approach a try and I became vegan. In addition to feeling good about eating compassionately and leaving a lighter footprint on the earth, I was so excited to find that my fatigue actually started to improve, despite what the so-called experts, in this case the medical professionals, said would happen. This personal experience opened the door to my thinking that diet really could make a difference in health and left me open to exploring other opportunities. When I learned about and implemented a raw food diet, my energy soared far beyond the impressive improvements that I experienced by eating vegan. Long story short, my fatigue vanished, along with a variety of other symptoms that I'd had for years, and I had more energy than I knew what to do with. I could not remember a time when I felt better. I started to look healthier, and I slept better. I enjoyed exercising, and my digestion improved. I was so inspired by the health results I was experiencing that I felt compelled to learn more about the inner workings of the human body, nutrition, and the diet health connection. 
I really wanted to immerse myself in learning as much as I could. So I earned a second undergraduate degree in biology and then received doctorate level education in naturopathic medicine and chiropractic, which helped me to put everything that I observed into perspective and on a much deeper level. Over the years, I've refined and revised my approach to raw food and tailored it to my individual needs. And we can show you how to do this too. Next, Dr. Rick will share with you a bit about his background and experience with raw food and plant-based nutrition. So take it away, Dr. Rick. Here are a couple of photos of me before and after from my late teens. They're about a year and a few months apart. In the process of going from the first photo to the second one, as you can imagine, I felt an awful lot better. That very much inspired me to keep learning as much as I could. Now, in the past year's webinars, I have given some more details about my background. I've included things like athletic endeavors, race times, etc. So if you go back and watch some of those webinars, you can see more details. Also, for those of you who saw our 2023 Raw Food and Plant-Based Mastery Summit, Dr. Karen and I each did a self-interview where we shared quite a bit more about our background. So if you saw that or if you have purchased the summit and have lifetime access, you can see more details. Uh, for this webinar, though, we're just going to cover the basics and keep things succinct to keep things moving. A few years after each of those photos that you saw, I graduated from the University of Connecticut with a degree in business administration. After graduating, I got a job as a chiropractic assistant and saw some really excellent things happen with patient recovery during that time. After a year of that, I had the opportunity to work at a raw vegan health institute in West Palm Beach, Florida. Some of you have been around the movement for a while. Remember the juice man, a guy named Jay Cordich, who would come on infomercials and, and talk about juices. Uh, so for a while back in the early 90s, I was part of the support team that would travel around the country and put on seminars and sell juicers and talk to people about the benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables uh, and their juices. So that was pretty fun. At that point, it was extremely clear to me that I was really into health and wanted to make a, a lifetime career out of that. So I went back to school to earn a doctorate degree in chiropractic. And I've got to say, so many things that I knew about already about health got so much more clear and I understood in so much more depth and understood how it all fit together so much more by learning all of the sciences, earning my doctorate degree uh, to a level that just would not have been possible without some type of advanced degree like that. That also afforded me the opportunity to go to True North Health, where I did a six month internship and then ended up staying for four years. Those of you who don't know, True North Health is a medically supervised water only fasting center. I got to witness or be involved in the supervision of the care of six to 800 fasting patients during that time. And I saw some absolutely remarkable things. Uh, a lot, lot I could say about that, but it, it was truly remarkable. And I uh, got to just a wealth of clinical experience from that. I was actually stolen away from True North by my long distance girlfriend at the time. Uh, whose name is, was Dr. Karen. She was becoming Dr. Karen. She actually um, was going to Bastyr University, as you hear, heard her say in the naturopathic medical program. So I moved up there with her, and I actually developed a curriculum that I taught to the naturopathic medical students. As I mentioned at the beginning, we developed the science of raw food nutrition curriculum uh, over the course of several years. I mean, it was thousands of hours worth of effort to put that course uh, together and uh, and it laid the foundation. Now, sorry, we taught that in person for about 10 years and that laid the foundation for the new and improved Mastering Raw Food Nutrition curriculum that we are going into our ninth year of teaching now. For several of these years, in addition to a lot of clinical experience from True North, I worked with patients who were vegans and raw vegans or those who would like to be 
guiding them nutritionally, looking at their lab work, etc. And I, I learned an awful lot there as well. Things you, you can't learn from reading in books and those types of things. One of the nice things I like about that is a lot of my clinical experience working with patients was incorporated and still is incorporated into our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition curriculum. And a lot of the things we teach our students very much come in handy with our patients also. So the two of those very much work synergistically. Now that we've covered the introduction and you know a little bit more about who you'll be hearing from, let's move on to the educational topic for this webinar, Misconceptions About Fruit. Fruit is a popular topic of conversation in the raw food community, the plant-based community, and just the nutrition world in general. There are so many points of view on fruit, some favorable and some not. So today we're going to clarify some of the misconceptions about fruit so that you'll have reliable science-based information to make more informed food choices. Now, if we're going to talk about fruit, it's important to consider fructose, which is a simple sugar that's found in fruit. So to get started, what is fructose? Fructose is a monosaccharide. Mono means one and saccharide means sugar. And fructose is one of the simplest sugars of all, along with glucose. Fructose is one of the primary sugars found in fruit and is found in other whole natural plant foods too. The fructose found in whole natural plant foods is accompanied by vitamins, minerals, fiber, antioxidants, phytonutrients, and water. So essentially, fructose in whole foods is in a complex with a variety of other nutrients. Now, fructose that's found in processed foods, by contrast, does not necessarily have these same benefits or these same nutrients in a whole food complex, because in processed foods, those elements have likely been processed out to some degree. It really depends on the food. I've actually heard people use fructose and high fructose corn syrup interchangeably but they're very different in composition and in how the body treats them. So I just want to touch on this subject for just a couple minutes here. Fructose is not the same as high fructose corn syrup. Fructose is 100% fructose, whereas high fructose corn syrup is composed of fructose and glucose. It's a combination of the two. The predominant form of high fructose corn syrup is composed of 55% fructose and 45% glucose. So a little bit more fructose than glucose. Here's a pictorial representation of the two. Fructose is 100% fructose, whereas the predominant form of high fructose corn syrup is 55% fructose, 45% glucose. So how do they compare when it comes to the glycemic index, for example. Here is a table that shows fructose, high fructose corn syrup, and glucose, and the glycemic index of each. So for fructose, as we can see here, the glycemic index is 15 plus or minus four. Now, what does this actually mean? What's the plus and minus about? What that is, is that there were different sources of fructose that were tested, different samples. And the range that was found was 11 to 19. So 15 plus or minus four corresponds to 11 up to 19. That was the range of the glycemic index for the samples that were tested of fructose. High fructose corn syrup, 62. And then glucose, 103 plus or minus three. So the range for glucose among the samples that were tested were 100 up to 106. Now, what is the glycemic index? The glycemic index is a measure of the effect of carbohydrate on blood sugar levels. It's a measure of how fast blood sugar levels rise after the consumption of a particular type of food. Now, all else being equal, the higher the glycemic index, the quicker the blood sugar rise. 
So here are the glycemic index numbers right here. And as we go through the rest of the presentation, just try to keep these numbers in mind. We'll mention them throughout the presentation, but just think about them as we go through subsequent slides. Foods that are 55 or less in terms of glycemic index value are considered to be low on the glycemic index. Foods that are 56 to 70 are considered to be moderate on the glycemic index. And foods that have a glycemic index value of 71 to 100 or higher are considered to be high glycemic. So for comparison here, let's take a look at fructose, high fructose corn syrup, and glucose. As we can see, fructose is low on the glycemic index at 15 plus or minus 4. That's well below 55. High fructose corn syrup is 62, which is moderate glycemic. And then glucose is 103 plus or minus 3. That's high glycemic. And it's not surprising to see high fructose corn syrup at 62 here, intermediate between fructose and glucose, because high fructose corn syrup, at least the, the most popular form of it, is 55% fructose and 45% glucose. So this value of 62 makes sense. Now, let's take a look at the glycemic index value for a variety of different fruits so that we can put what we learned here into context. Once again, low glycemic foods are 55 or less, moderate would be 56 to 70, and high over 71. So if you take a look on the table up here, we have a variety of popular fruits. We've got cherries, grapefruit, uh, pears, strawberries, peaches, and grapes. Cherries are pretty sweet, but look at this. They're 22 on the glycemic index, that's low. Grapefruit, 25. Grapefruit isn't particularly sweet, although sometimes it can be, but it is considered to be low glycemic at 25. Pears have a glycemic index of 38 plus or minus 2, so they're considered to be low glycemic. Strawberries, 40 plus or minus 7, so they're low glycemic also. Peaches, 42 plus or minus 14. Most of the samples of the peaches that were tested are considered to be low glycemic, but it looks like some of the samples, or maybe one of the samples um, on the upper end of the range, uh, is dipping into the moderate range. Grapes, 46 plus or minus 3. Low glycemic. Wow. <laughs> that surprised me when I first saw it. Uh, with grapes, the range is 43 up to 49, considered to be low glycemic. Now bananas, wow. Bananas, 51 plus or minus 3. A lot of people are surprised at this one. Bananas are considered to be low glycemic. Mangoes, 51 plus or minus 5. Uh, they dip into the moderate range at their upper range, okay, but they're mostly low glycemic. Pineapples, 59 plus or minus 8, so moderate. Um, Figs, dried figs specifically, 61 plus or minus 6. Okay, those are considered to be moderate glycemic. Raisins, 64 plus or minus 11. Uh, those are moderate to high. Not surprisingly, a lot of the dried fruits kind of dip into the high range. Watermelon, 76 plus or minus 4. I'm going to actually talk about watermelon in just a couple of minutes in the context of glycemic load, because glycemic index is important to consider, but we also have to look at the amount of carbohydrate in the food that we're consuming. And with watermelon, since there isn't a tremendous amount of carbohydrate per serving, uh, it's considered to be low glycemic load. We'll talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Now, dates, specifically medjool dates, 103 plus or minus 21, so high glycemic. Now, other types of dates are actually in the low and, in some cases, in the moderate range. So it really just depends on the dates. But here I've actually showed medjool dates because that was the information that was available to me at the time that I made this table. 
Now, what about other foods that people on plant-based diets consume? Let's take a look at carrots, for example. Uh, carrots are oftentimes thought to be high glycemic because they're pretty sweet. Uh, they sort of have that reputation for whatever reason. But as you can see here, carrots are 16 on the glycemic index. That's considered to be low. Lentils, 32 plus or minus 5. That's low glycemic. Yams, yams, they're pretty sweet, right? Uh, 37 plus or minus 8. That's low glycemic. Boiled carrots. Yeah, it is true that the glycemic index of carrots increases when we cook them. So here's an example of that. Boiled carrots, 39 plus or minus 4. That is considered to be higher, obviously, than raw carrots, but still low glycemic. And just to reiterate here, foods that are 55 or less are considered low glycemic. Uh, moderate would be foods that are 56 to 70, and then high glycemic foods are 71 or over. Now, what about other types of foods? For example, processed foods. Where are they on the glycemic index? That would be very interesting for comparison purposes. Now, popcorn isn't especially sweet, but as you can see here, it's in the moderate glycemic range with a glycemic index value of 55 plus or minus 7. Candy bars can vary because the composition of candy bars can, can definitely be different depending on the candy bar that we're talking about, so 55 plus or minus 14. Uh, not surprising. High fructose corn syrup containing cola, 63. It's very similar to the glycemic index value of high fructose corn syrup at 62. Uh, pancakes, spaghetti, uh, white bread. The, as you can see, the glycemic index ranges for those are moderate to high. And then getting into the high range, we've got a breakfast cereal, french fries, waffles, donut, jelly beans, sports drinks, not surprisingly, those are high glycemic. It's also important to mention that many high fructose corn syrup containing foods are also high in fat and are often consumed in excess of the person's needs, potentially leading to weight gain. So it's not just about the glycemic index value of the food, it's also about the fat content and so much else as well. Now next, I'd like to touch on this topic of the glycemic load. Because the glycemic index value considers the rise in blood sugar, but it doesn't necessarily consider the carbohydrate content of the sample being considered. So as we can see here on the slide, the glycemic load is equal to the carbohydrate content of the food times the glycemic index divided by 100. So foods with a low glycemic load are 10 or under, moderate would be 11 to 19, and high is 20 or over. So let's take a look at the foods or some of the foods that we talked about previously to see where they are in terms of glycemic load. So cherries, and grapefruit, low glycemic, and also low glycemic load. Apples and pears, we actually didn't talk about apples, but apples, um, 36, glycemic index, pears, 38, glycemic index. And as you can see here, uh, they are both considered low in terms of glycemic load. Strawberries, 40 on the glycemic index, five glycemic load. Peaches, 42 glycemic index, 6 glycemic load. Now grapes, 46 glycemic index, but 13 glycemic load. So those would be moderate. And the same thing with bananas. Bananas have a glycemic index of 51 with a glycemic load of 14. Uh, mangoes are considered to be low glycemic, but then look up here glycemic load is 18. Actually, I want to clarify this. Mangoes on their upper range would be considered to be 
uh, moderate glycemic because I mentioned that the uh, the range for mangoes is 51 plus or minus 5 so they are dipping into the moderate range glycemic wise uh, but in glycemic load they are 18 so they are definitely moderate there pineapples uh, glycemic index 59 13 glycemic load so that is moderate figs are moderate glycemic and in terms of glycemic load they are high because they're so concentrated they don't have a lot of water in them so for a sample of figs there's a lot more carbohydrate than what you would have with for example a more watery fruit and a good example here would be watermelon so watermelon as we talked about earlier has a glycemic index of 76 but look at this it has much lower available carbohydrate in it because it has so much water in it so therefore has a low glycemic load pretty amazing wow look at the difference between the two of them water can make a huge difference one cup of diced watermelon taking into account the amount of carbohydrate in the sample gives us a low glycemic load so in general what we're seeing here in terms of the trend is that foods that tend to be higher in water content tend to be lower in terms of glycemic load and then for comparison here I actually have a donut a large glazed donut 76 on the glycemic index but look at the amount of available carbohydrate there 45.1 which gives us a glycemic load of 34 definitely high water content can make a big difference in glycemic load and so can also fiber it's something to think about here so that when we're considering the glycemic index of a food we also need to consider water and fiber content um, hence the glycemic load so just wanted to mention that here so that you don't go thinking that watermelon is a scary food because it's got a high glycemic index when in fact it has a low glycemic load which brings us to our next interesting topic now for several years now there's been this perception or rumor that all fructose turns to fat in our body specifically in our liver now is this actually true now, let's take a look at this concept from a biochemical standpoint now what we see here is a biochemical map of the fate of fructose in the human body now I know that this chart looks a little bit complicated so I have distilled it down into a more simple visual representation here but before we go on I just want to mention that this actually shows what's called the glycolytic pathway glycolysis um, as some of you might know and as you can see fructose can enter glycolysis and so can glucose so glucose can have similar fates to fructose in in the glycolytic pathway it can either go into glycogen synthesis um, energy production or fat production but anyway on to the more simplified version of this so that we can understand really what's going on so as you can see here up on the screen fructose has essentially three fates in the human body and which fate is chosen for fructose or the pathway that it takes depends on the metabolic situation in the body so what we can see here is that fructose can either be converted into glycogen or it can be used for energy production or it can be converted into triglycerides uh, that's another term for fat and Dr. Rick will explain what triglycerides are in just a minute now getting back to glycogen what exactly is glycogen um, perhaps you've heard of it before but if not it's the storage form of carbohydrate in our body our body stores a limited amount of carbohydrate in the form of glycogen in our muscles and our liver and uses that glycogen for energy when we need it such as when we haven't eaten for a number of hours and I'll give an example next for some clarification now just to reiterate before we go forward the fate of fructose really depends on the current metabolic situation or the needs of the body so let me use myself as an example now I enjoy running so let's just say that I I wake up on one particular morning and I decide that I want to go for a five mile run first thing before eating um, I haven't eaten anything since the night before and that meal was digested a long time ago 
In, in other words, I don't have a recently consumed source of calories. So when I'm on my run, where are my calories coming from? Since the preferred fuel for my muscle cells is carbohydrate, uh, my body largely uses glycogen to fuel my run. So when I get back from my run and have one of my fruit-based green smoothies, where does that fructose go? What was it used for? Is that fructose going to replenish my glycogen stores that I used some of when I went out on my run? Is it going to be used for energy production? Or is it going to be stored as fat or go into triglycerides where it can be eventually stored as fat. What happens is that a good amount of that fructose is going to replace the glycogen that I used on my run. Now, some of it is going to go into immediate energy production, but a large percentage of it is very likely going to go into glycogen store to replace the glycogen that I used on my run. Now let's just say that a couple days later, I decide that when I wake up in the morning, I'd like to go for a run. I'm extra hungry, so I eat my fruit-based green smoothie first, and then I wait an hour or two before going on the run. Now, while I'm on my run, what's going to happen to the fructose from that green smoothie? Is it going to go into glycogen production? Glycogen storage? Is it going to go into fat production? You know, is it going to go into glycogen? Is it going to go into fat? Hmm, let's see. No, actually my body needs that energy right now for my run. So that fructose is very likely going to be going into energy production. Yeah. Now, for our last scenario, let's say that it's a special occasion on some other day. It's evening and I've eaten all of my meals of the day. In other words, I've eaten all of the calories that I need for the day at this point. Now, since it's a special occasion and we have guests who have brought over a raw cake, we all decide to have some. Now, since the cake has a fructose-based sweetener in it, what now likely happens to the fructose in that cake? Now, does it go into glycogen or energy production? Yeah, is it going to go into energy production or is it going to go into glycogen storage? No, most likely not. Uh, since I've previously eaten all the calories that I need for the day, my glycogen stores are filled already. Yep, and I have plenty of calories from my previous meals to create energy. So what's going to happen in this situation is that the fructose from the sweetener in that pie is probably going to be converted into triglycerides and maybe eventually even stored as body fat. So as we can see here, fructose has many fates, depending on the metabolic situation in the body, which can vary depending on timing of eating, level of activity, the amount of calories consumed. Fructose does not always turn into fat. And Dr. Rick will now continue the conversation. Let's start out by taking a quick look at what a triglyceride actually is. So we have a glycerol represented by this yellow oval. That's the glyceride component. And the tri part comes from three fatty acids represented by these squiggly lines attached to the glycerol. Now, fatty acids is one of my favorite topics, and it would be fun to talk about why these are different shapes, and we go into great depth and detail about that for six or seven hours in our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course. But for now, just know that a typical triglyceride um, has different fatty acids attached to it. That's why these have a different shape attached to a glycerol molecule. Like Dr. Karen shared with you, looking at those metabolic pathways, when are liver and other organs manufacture fatty acids, including when they do so from fructose, they package that fat up as triglycerides. And triglycerides are the primary way that fat is transported in the body as well as is stored in the body. So if all fructose turned to fat, the level of triglycerides in the bloodstream would be extremely elevated 
in people who eat a lot of fruit, who consume a lot of fructose. Now, luckily, I've been working with people who eat plenty of fruit in their diet for many years now, and I have been measuring, among lots of other things in their lab testing results, the level of triglycerides. So we can actually put that claim to the test to see how it actually works in the real world, in addition to seeing what Dr. Karen taught us looking at those metabolic pathways, which weren't just made up. <laughs> there's a reason that, that scientists have figured all that stuff out, and there's a reason that um, all those pathways are the way that Dr. Karen showed us. So to take a fast look here, per capita consumption of high fructose corn syrup in the United States from 2000 to 2019, we can see that it's actually been going down over the years. I'm going to pick 41.4 from 2016. And if you do the math here, what you find out that that comes out to 28 grams of fructose per day for high, from high fructose corn syrup from the average person uh, in the United States in 2016. Let's see how that compares to someone who eats a, a raw vegan diet with plenty of fruit. So I'm going to make some I, what I think are very reasonable assumptions here. We're going to go with a 2,000 calorie diet. We're going to say 80% of those calories come from fruit. Not always that high. Sometimes it's higher. Sometimes it's a little lower. In my case, it's maybe 60 or 70%. But we're going to pick 80% here. And we're going to say then that those 2,000 calories, if 80% come from fruit, 1,600 calories come from fruit. Fruit has about 90% of its calories from carbohydrates. So we'll take the 1,600, multiply it by 90%. We get 1,440 calories from the carbohydrates in fruit. And of the carbohydrates in fruit, about half of it is fructose and about half of it is glucose. So our 1,440 times 50% equals 720 calories from fructose, and as a lot of you know, one gram of a carbohydrate, and fructose qualifies for that, has four calories. So we take calories and divide by four to get to grams, and we come out to about 180 grams of fructose per day, much higher than 28 grams per day. So let's take a look at the visual of that in the following chart. So even if you went back a couple decades and high fructose corn syrup was higher, and even if you don't eat 80% of your calories from fruit, but by the way, vegetables have some fructose in there as well, so I didn't count those. Um, no matter what you do here, you see much, much higher fructose consumption in high fruit raw vegans or people, no matter what, who eat plenty of fruit in their diet compared to fruit uh, fructose consumption from high fructose corn syrup in the form of processed food. So let's take a look. Uh, what we're going to do here is we are going to actually look at lab values, triglyceride values, as well as uh, we'll see some cholesterol and HDL and LDL. And what is claimed is that this 28 grams of fructose from high fructose corn syrup is responsible for elevated triglycerides, high HDL, excuse me, high LDL, um, and high glucose, and a whole bunch of other problems leading up to metabolic syndrome and other issues. So if this is true, if fructose is really the single culprit, then the lab values from those things I mentioned of these high fruiters should be absolutely disastrous. So let's take a look. We're going to look at a bunch of people I've worked with, starting with myself. So this is over several years. And what we see here is my triglyceride levels. And by the way, my diet for 35 years now has averaged about 90% raw. I eat lots of vegetables. I eat about 20% of my calories from fat. And the rest, most of the rest of my calories come from fruit. So maybe two thirds of my calories come from fruit. I'm at the 150 or so grams of fructose per day level uh, approximately. So what are my triglycerides here? 45. Now, the reference range here says 35 to 200. 
You'll see later on the reference range uh, stops at 150. Some labs have a little bit higher values. I actually like to see triglycerides in the double digits. In other words, under 100. Uh, I, I think that's good. Now, by the way, another myth, there's so many myths, we're just mostly looking at fructose and fat here, if that all turns to fat uh, in the liver. But some people claim that on a vegan diet, you, you can't make cholesterol. Uh, you'll see here, there's always cholesterol uh, that comes along <laughs> with the triglycerides because they're part of a lipid panel or a lipid profile. And if you didn't have cholesterol in your body, your cell membranes would not work. You, you could not survive. You could not make any sex hormones. You cannot survive without those. You could not break down dietary fat so your body could digest it. You would be seriously deficient in all of the fat-soluble nutrients, carotenoids, vitamins A, D, E, and K, etc. cetera. So um, it's, it's an erroneous claim. So take a look at the cholesterol levels uh, if you wish. So anyway, I was at 45 here. I was at 54 down here. So in other words, those are, those are very healthy, reasonable levels. Let's go on to uh, some other results here. Now this one, I will admit I was stressed out um, in my relationship at the time. I was eating some vegan junk food. I was still about 90% raw, but I ate some, some cookies and other vegan junk food things. Uh, my triglycerides were a little bit higher, still pretty good. And notice my cholesterol was higher. It was at 179 instead of 120 and 124 previously. Uh, my next results show a triglyceride level of 32. This note says that was my lowest ever at the time, and, and I think it still is. My total cholesterol was 139. And then down here, my triglycerides were 54. My cholesterol was still a little higher than where it usually is, and that's because I was eating a couple of cases of young coconuts per week at the time. I'd, I'd put a coconut and the jelly in there uh, with a couple fresh bananas and some frozen mango and maybe a vanilla bean, and, and I was really into making those because at the time, you could get a case of young coconuts, nine of them, for five or six dollars, and it was hard not to take advantage of that. These days, it's five or six dollars for each coconut, um, and, and I think that's unfortunate. But nevertheless, my cholesterol went up there. Triglycerides were still good, whereas next time I just stopped the coconuts. Uh, it was hard to do because I loved them. My cholesterol came back down to 138, and look at that. My triglycerides were back down in the mid-30s, um, which is still really excellent. Okay, so I'm still on track here. Triglycerides of 56. Now we can see the reference range goes from 0 to 149 for triglycerides. And on this bottom one here, I'm at 35. So we've seen uh, quite a few already, and that's pretty indicative of my high fruit diet and what my cholesterol and triglyceride levels are. Uh, so let's see. This top one is actually still of me. Uh, my triglycerides were 59 that time, and now they're saying, again, less than 150. Um, these middle and bottom results are from a woman who was who eats maybe 20% of his cal their calories from fat, lots of vegetables, 50 to 60% of their calories come from fruit, so they might be in the 120 grams of fructose per day range, 120, maybe 140, because there's some fructose in the vegetables. Uh, but in any case, what we can see is when she was 38 years old, her triglycerides were 64. And a few years later, when she was 41, her triglycerides were 68. All right, let's look at a few more here. These top and middle ones were from a, a fit, healthy woman in her mid-30s. She ate cooked food, something cooked at a restaurant, maybe once a week on average. Um, plenty of vegetables, approximately 20% of her calories from fat, and the rest of her calories came from fruit. So again, she's somewhere in the 120 to 140 or so range of fructose per day. We can see triglyceride levels of 57 there, and uh, this was five months later, I believe. Uh, 55 in the middle a few months later.
So here is uh, on the bottom is a male in his early 30s, uh, liked to eat coconuts at the time like I was for a while, um, pretty low fat, 50, 60 or so percent of his calories come from fruit. His triglycerides were 87. So hopefully we're really starting to get the idea now of what this looks like. Now here are five results in a row, just the lipid panels here, of a male in his early to mid 50s, very fit, a uh, regular runner, and he was an official low fat raw vegan following Dr. Graham's 80-10-10 program, where 80% of the calories come from carbohydrates, 10% of the calories come from protein, and 10% of the calories come from fat. It's a high fruit diet, very little added fat, maybe a half an avocado a day, plenty of vegetables in there uh, for most of the 80 10 tenors, which is good to see, including my patient here. And he was somebody who was probably consuming over 200 grams of fructose per day from his diet because he was physically fit, uh, ate a lot of fruit, and had plenty of calories. So anyway, that's the profile. So let's go through here. First time, 86 for triglycerides. Next time, 101, a little bit higher than I'd like to see there, 70, happier with that, 98, still good um, for the basic reference ranges there, a little bit higher than ideally I would like to see because I've got a, a narrower, more stringent, uh, healthier range uh, compared to the average. You don't necessarily always want to be average. You can't be too different either because uh, even when you eat a, a vegan diet, some things still have to all always be the same. In any case, in the final one, it was 78. You take all those and average them out together, you come out to 87, still significantly below 100, and that was really good to see. And you can see that there's a cholesterol there every time. Not consuming any cholesterol, which makes it pretty darn clear that this person, as well as everyone else we've seen thus far, can make their own cholesterol. And again, if that couldn't happen, we would not be alive. Uh, so, you know, all there's just so many silly uh, myths out there. Okay, so a few more to wrap things up. This top, These top results were from a, a male, also in his early 50s, who had previously been all raw for four years, then he added some cooked food back into his diet for about two and a half years, and then he had been all raw again for a few months at the time of the labs, and he checked in with me for a consult, and we took a look at some of his results here. Now, by the way, things like cholesterol and triglycerides change within a few days when you make dietary changes. Um, other things take longer, so even though he was only back on raw for a few months, that, you know, everything was already reflected in his numbers here. We're focusing on triglycerides. His triglycerides were 57. Next, this was a woman in her late 40s who ate tons and tons of vegetables, like five to six pounds of vegetables per day, a few nuts and seeds, all the rest of her calories came from fruit. So she was in the upper hundreds for fructose consumption from fruit. Her triglycerides were 43. That is excellent. And these final two were both young women who were also on an 80-10-10 diet, high fruit diet, includes some vegetables, very little extra fat in there. Um, this patient was uh, 22 years old at the time, had triglycerides of 90, and this patient was 26 years old at the time, 101, not quite perfect for my standards, but still well within the normal range. And if all the fructose she consumed turned into fat, these numbers that we'd see on her and everybody else would be way up into the upper hundreds, maybe even into the thousands. Which reminds me, there was one time I actually saw triglyceride levels in the four digits, in the thousands. This person wasn't consuming fruit, didn't consume much fructose at all, but did actually have liver disease, and that was causing uh, the issue. So there we have um, some pretty typical findings from high fruit vegan eaters. So the triglycerides, like we saw, were in a healthy range. 
And you know, sometimes you see those ads on TV where they have the great case histories and it says in the fine print down the bottom, results not typical. That's not what this is. This is very indicative of what I have seen in lots of other people. I didn't just cherry pick these um, to show something out of context to prove a point like a lot of people do out in the world today. This is very, very indicative of what I see regularly. We also see, and if those of you are watching the recording, you can go back and, and take a look and hit pause if you'd like. And if you're here live and you want to see the recording, go to our website, rawfoodeducation.com, and then click on the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition tab. You can scroll down and all of our webinar recordings are there. Uh, you can, again, watch the recording, hit pause, and take a look at the LDL and the VLDL all in really healthy ranges, all nice and low. Just a little side note on that, not all LDL is so bad, even though it's considered the bad cholesterol, it depends on the, the type of LDL, and you can look at the particle sizes and the particle counts, and the small dense LDL is a problem, considered to be atherogenic, but the large buoyant LDL is not considered to be a problem. But when your total LDL is nice and low, it hardly matters what type of fractions you have because it's really low and that's not going to be a problem. We also tend to see liver enzymes healthfully low. Now, the reason that is really important to mention here is because in the anti-fructose camp where fruit is the evil villain that's going to raise your triglycerides, which we've already seen doesn't typically happen, they say that all that fructose can lead to something called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which was probably what that previous patient I mentioned was dealing with, which raised their triglycerides to, you know, really, really pathological levels. But they claim that eating fruit will do that as well. And when that's the case, if your liver is sick like that, you will see elevated liver enzymes. I don't know if I've ever seen, and if I have, it's, it's a, a major exception, not the rule of any healthy raw vegans who eat plenty of fruit with elevated liver enzymes. So that part doesn't add up either. What else? Uh, as long as we're at it, they often say that fruit will uh, raise your blood sugar level, and in some circumstances it can, but in all the high fruit eaters that I've worked with, just about all of them, 95 to 98% of them, their blood sugar numbers are excellent. In fact, that's kind of my favorite part of going over the lab work. I say, okay, here we go. If, if what the claims out there were true, you'd have high glucose, high A1C, elevated insulin, and, um, and we just don't see that regularly. I, I could go through and show you a bunch of results, like I did with the triglycerides, but we would see that um, the, the blood sugar numbers look really good also, which is very helpful to know. So what happens here is there's a lot of misinformation out there, and misinformation can dissuade you from eating really healthy foods like fruit, and then people eat less healthy things instead. And it's, it's just so heartbreaking for Dr. Karen and I to see people who really want to be healthy, but who get led down the wrong path because of misinformation. It, it is really difficult uh, to see that happen. So let's sum up what we see in the studies that claim that fructose all turns to fat in the liver and is going to raise your triglycerides and you know fatty liver and cause all those issues. There have been some studies with omnivores as well as rodents showing that when you are in an excess calorie environment, that excess calories from fructose are more likely to turn into fat compared to excess calories from other sources such as glucose. So there is some truth to that, but in the high fruit raw vegan dieter eaters that we saw many examples of, there is a completely different overall situation. So in the rodents who they're not cool, I wish they just leave the rodents out of this and let them go run around in the field and do their own thing. And for the omnivores that they look at, the high fructose corn syrup is where they're getting their fructose from. And that is 
in within a profile of a low water, low fiber, low vitamin, mineral, phytonutrient, and antioxidant diet where the food is really calorie dense and they are over consuming calories. There's usually too much fat in there also, and they've got an unhealthy balance of essential fats. When we are looking at the high fruit raw vegans, we are looking at a more optimum calorie intake. They tend to have a lot less body fat, but adequate amounts as long as they're doing everything properly. It's a high water, high fiber, high nutrient, vitamin, minerals, phytonutrient, and antioxidant environment. And there is a healthy mix of essential fatty acids. So you can't just take one substance, in this case fructose, out of context and make claims that, that may apply in certain circumstances, but make those apply globally, uh, including having people be afraid of fruit. It is a major, major mistake. And unfortunately, in today's world where everyone's out there on social media with their different opinions and, and looking to get hits and looking to, to generate the income uh, from views and, and selling people on programs that don't necessarily work uh, because you know they, they get a lot of followers, there is more misinformation than ever before. It's part of what I call the information age paradox. There's more information about pretty much everything available to us, including nutrition, than there ever has been before, but the percentage of it that's accurate keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller as people without education go out there and take up the airspace, if you will, take up the social media space and collect followers. It's getting harder and harder all the time. And there's all sorts of myths out there, such as the one we looked at here today, fruit causing diabetes. Some people say things like all fat consumption puts stress on the liver. So, you, you know, you shouldn't eat any fat at all. Leafy green vegetables rob nutrients from your body because of oxalate and phytate. Raw cruciferous vegetables damage your thyroid. I've been eating a head of raw cauliflower a day for 35 years. I've had about 12,000 heads of it. My, and lots of kale and other stuff. My thyroid's doing very well. Some people think fruit-only diets are fruit and herb cleanses over extended periods of time are healthful, and somehow vegetables will inhibit the cleansing process. It's actually exactly the opposite. Uh, what else do we hear? You can't get enough beta carotene from raw food and you have to cook. Dr. Karen and I have obliterated um, that claim. Uh, we had a webinar a few years ago where we looked at that. We've actually had a few of them. Uh, you can't turn beta carotene into vitamin A, so vegans are deficient in vitamin A. Uh, vegans can't make cholesterol and are unhealthy. We looked at that in this webinar here. So, gosh, folks, I just, just can't emphasize enough how important it is to have accurate, good, solid information that's truthful and factual so you can make the healthiest decisions about how to live your life, about how to not have diabetes and not deal with autoimmune diseases and, and, and not be overweight and not have inflammation in your body and feel better and have a better quality of life and be there for your grandkids and your great grandkids and just, just enjoy your life so much more. It's so, so super important. Okay, so if you are interested in learning about a program that is extremely thorough and comprehensive with information like this, please stay tuned to learn about our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition one-year online course that can cut through these uh, myths, give you factual information, and make you trend-proof and misinformation-proof, and give you confidence to be able to eat the healthiest possible diet for the rest of your life that can make a night and day difference in your quality of life, as well as your quantity of life. In today's presentation, we cover just a small fraction, a small sampling of what we have to offer. For those of you who would like to continue your education with us, please consider joining us for our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition 12-month online and interactive course. 
Our next course begins at the end of August. As you can see here, we recommend about four hours per week to be able to get the most value from the course. I'll first share some of the topics that we cover in this course so you know what to expect, followed by how the course material is delivered, interspersed with some comments from previous students about their experience in mastering raw food nutrition. So we cover a huge array of topics in the course. Pretty much everything that's really important to know about whole food plant-based nutrition from a raw fruit and vegetable based perspective that you can use to make sense out of all the information out there and really implement things to the fullest benefit and to your, the fullest extent possible. I've got a second slide of screens here with just they're coming out about a second at a time. And Dr. Karen and I have spent a lot of time thinking about what's most important and how do we deliver this information in a way that saves you time so you don't have to spend hundreds of hours out there figuring it all out. Each topic is important and we get succinct and we cover just the core, but in some depth and detail and then we see how everything all fits together. So here come some more topics as well. In the past, I've explained each of these and it takes seven or eight or nine minutes uh, to go through all of this, but I'm gonna let you just see the thumbnails that are coming out. And then in the next few screens after this, we've got the course divided into roughly four segments because there's four notebooks that I'll talk about in a few minutes. And these are the topics here that we cover in notebook number one. So for those of you watching the recording here, I'll let you hit pause so you can take a look at those topics. But for the rest of you, I will keep things moving. Here's what we cover in notebook number two. Again, a great time to hit pause and read this over. Here's what we cover in notebook number three. And here's what we cover in notebook number four. That all adds up to about 100 hours of pre-recorded video content similar to what you're seeing here with a PowerPoint presentation and either Dr. Karen or myself giving that presentation, we each cover about 50% of the course content. When we get to notebook four, you can see that some of these things have to do with the 20% or so of our students who wish to go out and educate other people. So some of this stuff is not relevant for everyone, building an audience, connecting with your audience, uh, basics of internet marketing. But for those of you who do want to go teach others, all of this information is incredibly valuable. Once again, for those of you not wanting to teach other people, just wanting to know this information for yourself, for your friends, for your family, to cut through the confusion, uh, to be as healthy as possible, a lot of the information here summarizes and solidifies what we had in the course up until that point. So for example, one of our students in last year's class, Billy, who is a nurse practitioner, I'm gonna to skip to the end here, says, I enjoyed the questions about raw food presentations delivered at the end. They really helped solidify knowledge. So she was talking about this section here. The rest of her testimonial says, I have really appreciated this course. Dr. Rick and Dr. Karen have skillfully amassed a huge database of nutrition information that they present here. They are completely non-judgmental. They are very well organized. They are super nice people. If you're looking for excellent information on good nutrition, you can't go wrong by attending this course. She also said, I really enjoyed the discussions on fatty acids and calorie density and fasting. Before I go on to how the course is delivered, let's take a look at another couple of testimonials. Here is a naturopathic practitioner named Amanda from France who said via email, and then I use this with her permission, she said, I take advantage of this email to tell you again how much I appreciate this curriculum. So valuable information and discussions. It is a great pleasure to attend it, and I can imagine the amount of research and work that you have done both to provide us with this quality training. 
We're always so honored when people like Amanda, who are already well-educated about nutrition, join us to bring their knowledge base up a few levels and be more effective to those who they influence, in the case of Amanda, her patients. Uh, we had another student from France who says, uh, in the same class, who says, Hi, my name is Nadej and I come from France. I chose to follow this course because I was following a raw food diet, but were a bit lost amongst all the discordant voices um, I heard about on social media. We all know how that goes. Furthermore, in my remissions from Crohn's disease, and yes, a raw foodist in remissions from Crohn's disease, that's a whole other topic, mastering my diet is really important for my health. The Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course delivered a very precise and scientifically proven way to have a raw food diet able to optimize health. They really helped me design my own diet and now on Chronometer, the app she uses to track her nutrients that we recommend, all the lights are green. I couldn't have chosen a more complete curriculum. The conferences each week were so helpful. I got all my questions answered and also learned a lot from the questions of my fellow students. Meeting people from all around the world every week and benefiting from all the wisdom and knowledge of Karen and Rick was priceless. I want to also share that the course really helped me design a better diet for my husband and kids, which are plant-based but not raw foodists. The course is really complete and help better understand nutrition as a whole, not only raw food nutrition, even if it's the main subject, we teach from a whole food plant-based perspective with an emphasis on raw fruits and vegetables. Nadej goes on to say, I even get to help omnivorous people around me getting toward a more plant-forward diet thanks to what I learned this year. Thank you so much, Karen and Rick. You changed my life for the better. We're always so honored to hear student experiences like that. We get a whole bunch of them every year. So how do we deliver the course content in order to create those type of experiences for our students? So first of all, there are two hours worth of professional quality videos released each week. Those are actually released on Wednesdays. You can watch those on your own schedule. Um, they remain there for the entire rest of the course. As long as you have internet access and a, a suitable device, you can access those videos. Like I mentioned earlier, it's two hours worth of an extremely efficient use of your time. All the gibberish is gone, and it really gets down to understanding the topics very thoroughly. For those who just want to listen and not watch the videos, this isn't so much of a, a concern these days, but in years past it was. You want to save some mobile data, for example, we have the audio-only version of the videos available as well. We physically mail you four comprehensive notebooks. It's about 900 pages worth of notes. We've got all the scientific references that we use to put the course together in the back, and they are designed to complement the educational videos. So if you have your notebooks open while you're watching the videos, 90% of the graphs and the information in bullet points is in the notebook. So you can not have to distract yourself trying to write everything down that you see in here. It's in the, most of it's in the notebooks. You may still want to take a few extra notes. That way you can really focus on what you're seeing and hearing and let the information sink in. These notebooks also provide lifetime reference material and many of our past students have shared with us that they're so happy they have these to just pull off their shelf and look at um, to look things up in the future. So there we go, uh, four of the notebooks. We mail those all over the world. Here's a couple of examples of what the notes look like. They don't say proof uh, in the real notebooks, but charts, graphs, um, we, we show how everything works. It, it's very solid reference material that helps enhance the learning experience in the course. Once you go through the two hours of educational videos each week, there is an optional quiz that you can access from the course outline, five question, multiple choice. 
and you pick the right answer. Uh, it tells you if it was right or if it was wrong. And then for each question, it gives you an explanation of why the right answer was right and why the other choices was wrong to help enhance the learning experience. So then after the videos are released on Wednesday, you go through your notebooks, you take the quiz. The following Tuesday, we have a live conference to cover that week and or the recent course material. So we, we were there every Tuesday except the last Tuesday of the month. We're there at two different times. So we're here in California on Pacific time. Conference number one is at 10 a.m. That's 1 p.m. Eastern time, 7 p.m. Central European time. Conference number two is 6 p.m. Pacific time, 9 Eastern, so in the evening for people in North America. Not a good time if you're in Central, if you're anywhere in Europe or in Israel, you're asleep then. That's why conference number one is best for students in those regions. Conference number two is also Friday morning or potentially early afternoon in places like Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Now, we chose those times to strategically hopefully cover most people in most regions. And if you can make one of those conferences live, that's fantastic. But even if you can't, you can submit questions in advance. And then during the conferences, Dr. Karen or I answer the questions in advance as well as the live questions. And then we audio record each of those conferences. So you might not act uh, interact with us in real time, but you can still submit your questions and then listen to the answers as well as the answers of questions from your fellow students and some of the discussion that ensues on the recordings all at your own schedule. So our students, so many of them just love those conferences. We also have uh, a, a format within our course delivery system where students can make posts and introduce themselves and get to know each other and share some experiences. We also have another section where we will oftentimes post links to articles and additional information when good questions come up during the live conferences. Uh, we'll add some extra information into our study group to help support answering those questions and making sure everyone understands the material. So to put that all into one slide here, two hours of professional videos per week with the audio only versions available as well, thoughtfully designed notebooks for each subject, weekly interactive optional quizzes, uh, near weekly live video conferences, and we have study and social groups in there as well. It's all designed to help everyone understand this material so they can utilize it most effectively in their lives. And there's the people on the bottom right jumping for joy. Now, as I mentioned, many of our students, 20% or so, want to teach other people, their coaches, their doctors, their nurses, their influencers. And for those people, as well as anyone else who would like to, we offer a certificate of accomplishment. About half of our students go through the process of earning a certificate. And in order to do that, there are three exams throughout the course, and we have our students submit a final project. For students who pass the exams and submit us a good quality final project, we print this out on really nice paper. It really says your name, not just your name here. And we sign it, and we physically mail it to you, and it is suitable for framing. So before we wrap up, I've just got a few more testimonials to take a look at. Uh, Lilla from Finland said, time and money well spent. Now I know more and can really answer to people who don't know. So many students tell us that it's easier to communicate with other people once they learn um, a lot of great information that makes sense to them and once they really understand it. Kimberly from Texas says, this class can save your life and make it so much better. She said, I loved the class and I'm so sad for it to end. Cynthia from California said, I enjoyed this class and learned a lot. You covered so many topics, including things I hadn't thought of before. I have a much clearer idea of how to design a raw and cooked diet for myself. Thank you. Kelsang from Spain said, what a year. It's amazing how much I've learned in this course, and it's been a lot of fun, too. 
Thank you, Drs. Rick and Karen, for putting together this amazing online course and for all the energy and support that you have given along the way. Many thanks to all of my classmates, too. All your questions and contributions have been wonderfully fruitful. In addition to all the goodies that I have gained from this course, also a love relationship came from this course. What else can I ask for? Now, it's really nice to go through a program with a bunch of other like-minded people who are willing to make the financial and the time investment in the course. Obviously, everyone's pretty enthused. Um, we can't guarantee that a love relationship is going to come out of it, uh, but this is really cool <laughs> when it happens. What we tend to hear consistently from our students year after year, class after class, including before we started teaching this Mastering Raw Food Nutrition course in the previous version called the Science of Raw Food Nutrition that we taught in person. We hear over and over again that students really appreciate the scientific accuracy and validity of what we talk about. They love that we go into some depth and detail and really answer some of the nitty gritty questions that are out there. As much as we're into science, we're known for making complex topics easy to understand. Some of our students are healthcare providers with science backgrounds, but most of our students are not. The healthcare providers like the accurate science, the other students like that it all makes sense, but they also have confidence that what they are learning is fully accurate. That helps to cut through the confusion so everything makes more sense. You don't have to spend tons of time being confused on social media and everything fits together into a cohesive whole. What we hear about ourselves personally as instructors in the course is that we are enthused and that we love answering questions. We have an encouraging and supportive attitude. We are also very rational and realistic, not extreme. We don't subscribe to or promote any dogma, our own or anyone else's. We truly want people to succeed over the long term. And as Billy said, and of other people have said, we're very nice people. What people get, what our students get from the course is the number one, they enjoy the learning process, like Kelsang said and many others, that it was fun. Most people find they make major improvements to their diets. It's an educational-based course, not a rah-rah motivation course, but it's very hard to not be really inspired by week after week learning about the benefits of fresh fruits and vegetables and other whole natural plant food. So we love seeing that. Because students are so well educated, they're much more likely to keep things up over the long term. They feel so much more confident about all of this than they did before, and they find it easier to speak to others about how to eat. They can answer questions better, uh, and they can speak with greater authority, and then they also have a greater ability to distinguish nutritional reality from nonsense. Let me share just a couple of other things before we go. If you go to our website, rawfoodeducation.com, and you click on the testimonials page, you will see several testimonials from each class that we've had. We've had eight Mastering Raw Food Nutrition courses now. Um, one thing I wanted to share is that sometimes we have influencers and, and raw food celebrities, so to speak, join us. Uh, we had Lissa Maris of Raw Food Romance join us for our last year's class, as well as her husband, Nate. Uh, she absolutely loved the class and wrote us, I think she set a record uh, for the longest testimonial. So I'm going to save time now, but please read that over, especially if you're a fan of Lissa. And from our 20... 19-2020 class, I recently found an email that I hadn't put in here before, but this is from a student that says, I just want you to know that I am enjoying the class and am so thankful to be learning all of this valuable information. I am much better equipped to decide whether the nutritional information I come across in my daily life is valid or not. It is so comforting to know that my foundation of knowledge in nutrition is based on facts and your years of experience. I am feeling more confident in my ability to discuss my food choices and also to disagree with those who are peddling nonsense. I am also taking what I am learning and applying it to my own life. 
I am eating much less cooked food than when I started in the class and recently have adopted a lower fat diet after a coming to Jesus moment on chronometer. It has been so much easier to apply changes when I know exactly why I am doing them and what the benefits are going to be even before I do them. Thanks again for all you do and stay healthy. So we just love getting those testimonials every year from our students. And then one really final point. Many, most of you are probably watching this recording of this webinar on the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition tab of our website, rawfoodeducation.com. Some of you are here watching the live presentation in that case, you got an email with a link to speak to us about the course if everything you've heard sounds good and makes a lot of sense to you. If you're here watching the recording and you would like to speak with us, if you just scroll down to the very bottom of that page, here is a link right there. And if you scroll up a little ways, but still relatively near the bottom of the page, there is another link to speak to us here. For those of you who are considering joining us, please sign up for a time to speak with us and uh, we'll help determine if the course is a really good fit for you or if it's not. Thank you so much for your time and attention.